You can subscribe to The Leader through your preferred podcast provider so you never miss out every day at 4pm. Now, from the Evening Standard in London, this is The Leader. Hi, I'm David Marsland. Our intelligence services work to keep the country safe. Sometimes they can't. There are 3,000 active subjects of interest. There's another 20,000 or so so so-called closed subjects of interest. Unless you want to go down the road of having thousands of people pursued 24 hours a day, then you can't possibly have a fail-safe system of trying to detect when somebody's going to do something so simple. Our Home Affairs editor, Martin Bentham, on why failures that led to the London Bridge attack must not lead to the wrong lessons being learned. Also... Overcrowding, cancellation, delays, not just for one day, but for 27 working days. The Standard's Jonathan Prynne on the rail strike that's bringing misery to thousands. Taken from the Evening Standard's editorial column, this is The Leader. For the whole thing, pick up the newspaper or head to standard.co.uk slash comment. In a moment, the questions we should be asking in the wake of the London Bridge attack. The country's political leaders stood beside each other as silence fell before the bells rang at Guildhall Yard in London. Boris Johnson, Jeremy Corbyn and Sadiq Khan joined members of the public at the vigil to honour 25-year-old Jack Merritt and 23-year-old Saskia Jones. They were the victims of Usman Khan, a convicted terrorist released early on licence. There are many questions over how he was able to fool authorities into letting him into London and go to the prisoner rehabilitation event Jack and Saskia were supporting. But our editorial column says the work of those two young people should not be sacrificed for political gain. Jack Merritt and Saskia Jones were talented and caring young people who were helping offenders in prison return to society and give support to victims of crime. Our beautiful, talented boy died doing what he loved, surrounded by people he loved and who loved him, Mr Merritt's family said, words full of compassion. By contrast, the response from political leaders has been predictable and less impressive. From Labour, there have been stock complaints about cuts. But the man who carried out the attack has had resources lavished on his case. The problem is that this didn't stop him. The Conservatives have resorted to their lock him up and throw away the key approach that we thought had been consigned to the dustbin of failed ideas. The way Usman Khan was convicted, sentenced and then released early was obviously flawed. We need to know why. But rolling out headline-chasing claims, even while police were still on the scene of the attack, doesn't help. Our Home Affairs editor, Martin Bentham, has written a piece in The Standard looking at the work of the intelligence services in this area. And Martin, they work extremely hard, but they can't always keep us safe. No, and particularly given the relatively recent phenomenon of people carrying out these very crude attacks with weapons such as knives or indeed vehicles. Virtually impossible, obviously, to stop people getting those type of weapons and virtually impossible, potentially at least, to identify the moment at which somebody might carry out such an attack when, particularly if they seem to have been behaving quite well beforehand and show no particular signs. Back in the day, (laughs) you had the Al-Qaeda-type plots and They were very very complicated plots involving explosives, extensive number of people, desires to bring down aircraft and so on, which obviously have absolutely catastrophic consequences if they're ever realised, but give a lot of opportunity potentially for the security service and others to intercept and detect what's happening. Not quite the same when somebody just decides to pick up a knife and go out and randomly attack people. This is a man who was being monitored, who had a tag, who was banned from London but allowed in on a, on a kind of free pass for the day. 
There must be so many questions being asked right now. Well, I think from all that we know, he was complying with the terms of his release and he was appearing to be a model reformed prisoner. There doesn't seem, as we don't know the full details of the background of the case yet, and and other facts may emerge, but as as it stands, that's the best of, of our knowledge, that he was showing no signs of doing anything untoward, indeed was quite the reverse and and that obviously is a problem it's not clear whether he was genuinely trying to reform and then suddenly reverted or whether he always was concealing his true intent and just waited until he was given this opportunity of coming to London uh, to carry it out. So how do they try to keep us safe in these ever-changing strategies used by terrorists how do they keep ahead of them? Well, I think obviously one answer in in this case, what's particularly frustrating, I think, for those in MI5 and police is that they caught this man once involved in a serious, very, very serious plot. He was in prison. He was originally given an indeterminate sentence, which would have required him to have received parole board sanction before he was ever released and may have kept him in prison for longer. Obviously, that changed as a result of a court of appeal ruling. So for, in one sense, they did their job. They, they caught a dangerous person and then he's back on the streets and a problem. So there is an issue there about how long people serve. And that obviously has been part of the political discourse over the last 24 hours. When people are out, which most people eventually will come out, It's then a question of prioritising and, of course, what we can't see is what the other people, what the risk is of the other people that they're monitoring. There are 3,000 active subjects of interest, there's another 20,000 or so um, so-called closed subjects of interest, roughly speaking, and so there's a lot of people who potentially could pose a threat. And, of course, there are active plots underway, unfortunately, all the time, and so that's where they dedicate their resource if they had more resource theoretically they could do a bit more but actually unless you want to go down the road of having thousands of people pursued 24 hours a day by law enforcement and and spies and so on then you can't possibly again have a fail-safe system of trying to detect what's when somebody's going to do something so simple we now know the names and faces of the two victims of this attack and i think there's something It just adds to the tragedy that these were two young people, university graduates, who were working to help offenders. It's a very sad outcome, isn't it, that those people who believe in that and have achieved success. I mean, of course, one of the points is that it does achieve success, and this scheme appears to have been reasonably successful, but as with all schemes, it can't be be 100% successful, or it's unlikely to be 100% successful. There will always be people who don't respond or whatever. And as I say, it may be the case that he was responding and then suddenly something has happened that's flipped him back into a different direction. We just don't know that. But there obviously are people who have been through that scheme and others who have successfully reintegrated. Ultimately, for anybody who is going to come out, that has to be the the right approach to try to find ways to reintegrate them, to divert them from what they were doing to doing something more constructive. And I think, of course, it's been documented, hasn't it, that one or two of those who rushed to the onto the bridge to try to stop further attacks were indeed part of that cohort of freed uh, freed offenders who were trying to rehabilitate themselves. So all all credit all credit to them, and and that's an example perhaps of people who've done bad things doing the right thing. So we don't give up. No, and I don't think we ever should do. And you can read more from Martin in the newspaper or online at standard.co.uk. Next. Waterloo earlier, a station with very few trains to be heard as the RMT's Christmas strike begins. This is the train station at Bracknell. You can hear work being carried out, but no trains. The destination board is just a scrolling list of cancellations. The RMT's 27-day-long strike has now been unleashed and tens of thousands are suffering as hundreds of trains are cancelled. This newspaper says the action is unnecessary and has to stop. Commuters on routes to Waterloo have a big concern. The service has been slashed because of a strike by the RMT. It's an outrageous abuse of power by a union led by the hard left. Its complaint about safety and the role of guards is fictitious. But you won't hear Labour saying that. 
Instead, the party's trying to buy votes by promising cheaper tickets. Our advice? Read the small print. There's no money for it. Instead, it aims to raid the roads budget. It's a policy that would mean a worse transport system and less money for trains. If it really wanted to help passengers, it would stop the strike. The Standards, Jonathan Prynne has been covering the story. And Jonathan, lots of people listen to this podcast on the train. Sadly, I expect some of them will be listening while standing on a platform today. And I would very much love to tell them something good, but there isn't much good about this strike, is there? It really isn't good, I'm afraid. Um, For thousands, tens of thousands of commuters, it's going to be a pretty miserable run up to Christmas um, after the start of... 27 days of strikes um, from this morning, which means that about half of all services on Southwest Railways, which is one of the biggest uh, commuter franchises in, in the whole of uh, South East England, um, will be badly affected for uh, right up in, uh, through Christmas and up to the new year. What's this actually about? It's the, it's the, it's the issue that has dogged rail services throughout the commuter belt for years and years and years now and it's about the role of the guard on trains um, when the new generation of uh, of trains come into service. Um, Southwest Railways has committed to continuing use of guards but has said it wants to transfer responsibility for the dispatch of trains from platforms to drivers The union says that's just uh, a step towards abolishing the role of guards altogether, and uh, that's the reason they're going out on strike. They must feel, some of them, that is any of this necessary? I think uh, certainly a lot of the commuters we were talking to this morning uh, were utterly bemused that this issue can once again mean overcrowding, cancellation, delays, not just for one day, but for 27 working days uh, over the next uh, over the next month, uh, with just the one break for the general election, 12th of December, they're not going out on strike. They're coming back for one day, um, and for Christmas and Boxing Day, when you know traditionally there aren't any services anyway. So uh, basically, it's a month's worth of of misery. This strike is happening as commuters face fair rises as well, isn't it? Well, the supreme irony of this is that the strike comes to an end, uh, I think, on the 2nd of January, when uh, on the very day that the, uh, the the price rises come into effect for season ticket commuters um, for 2020. So it's going to be the end of one sort of period of misery and then straight into another uh, shock when they discover their season tickets are going up by 27 2.8% in the new year. And that's the leader. Our audio news team sends bulletins to smart speakers at 7am every morning. Give them a try. Just ask for the news from the Evening Standard. We'll be back with the best news, analysis and opinion in this podcast at 4pm tomorrow.